at speeds varying from 1,600 to 16,000 kilometers an hour. That's up to 17 times the speed of a jumbo jet. Everything has to work the first time. The lives of the crew will be riding on it. If that rendezvous should fail, not only does the mission lost, the crew is lost. If they make the rendezvous, the crew then sets off on the final leg of a journey that started nearly 24 months ago. But they're still not free and clear. There's always the danger of a microscopic, but deadly, stowaway. If the astronauts find microbial life on Mars, it must be handled with extreme caution. The spacecraft interior makes an ideal breeding ground if a rogue organism gets loose. If they run into something alive on Mars, you're not surprised by it later on, only after they come back to the Earth. After the moon landing in 1969, NASA worried that the astronauts might bring back an exotic microbe. So they developed the Mobile Quarantine Facility, a highly modified vacation trailer with an elaborate air filtration system. Recovery engineer John Hirosaki handled the moon dust cleanup. The fear was that if you had extraterrestrial sources of possible biological contamination, you could have a runaway contamination of the Earth's biosphere. You can get some very hostile invasive species occurring that you do, really do not want. This quarantine facility was state-of-the-art in its day, but the crew returning from Mars will undergo much tougher scrutiny. As the Planetary Protection Officer, you have to be a biocop. You're making sure we don't take Earth microbes to other places where they might grow and thrive. And if we bring something back, we want to make sure it doesn't contain the Andromeda strain. Even so close to home, the Mars explorers are still not out of the woods. If the crew members pose an unsupportable threat to the Earth, then they would have to agree that returning to the Earth in that condition is impossible. The astronauts would wait in Earth's orbit or in a quarantine facility on the moon until doctors were certain they posed no threat. Oh, that view is tremendous. Then, having survived the mental and physical strain of an epic journey, the astronauts face one final challenge, picking up the pieces of the life they left behind. Three years of your life you've been away from Earth. If your kids were 10 years old when you left, they're gonna be 13 when you come back. Leaving your family, your loved ones, the whole environment of the Earth, the impact of that is gonna be huge. The costs of a mission to Mars, both financial and perhaps personal, will be staggering. That's the inevitable price of becoming an interplanetary species. The real question is whether the red planet can support a human colony and a new way of life. It sounds like science fiction, but a growing number of researchers believe it just might be possible to turn the Martian desert into an oasis. Terraforming is a word that was defined first in science fiction. And it means just what it sounds like, terraforming, making like the Earth. But now we realize, actually, that for Mars, terraforming is possible. The fundamental challenge in making Mars a planet for life is warming it up. But well, we know how to warm up planets. There are two big theories on planetary warming. The first, we've already stumbled on, using greenhouse gases to heat up the atmosphere. What we have to do on Mars is what we're doing on Earth, produce these gases in factories. Hundreds of solar-powered factories will be set up on Mars and could begin to drive up the temperature within 100 years. The second theory on warming up Mars is literally out of this world. Gigantic mirrors the size of Texas floating in space to redirect and magnify the sun's rays. That sunlight would add energy to the polar regions, warm them up, which would in turn produce carbon dioxide gas, which would add to the atmosphere and make it thicker. It will be a painfully slow process, 
Just melting the ground ice could take several centuries. And even when Mars has finally warmed up, the atmosphere will still be poisonous carbon dioxide. To sustain human life, Mars will need a massive dose of oxygen. The only way we know how to make oxygen over a whole planet is with plants. So one of my interests is finding the plants that will be the first Martian pioneers. These little guys growing under the stone are actually making oxygen. These, these organisms can change a world. Billions of years ago, Earth didn't have any oxygen. It was organisms like these that produced the oxygen that got biology started on Earth. I think they can do the same thing on Mars. If humankind finds a way to transform Mars into a living, breathing planet, it may become the new world for the first wave of transplanetary immigrants. And this can happen once we have mastered the use of Martian resources. We'll be able to build more habitats. We'll be able to build domes, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, in which people can live in. I think Mars is a place we could go and live. I think we can build the systems to be safe. We can learn to make it a habitable environment, the way we've started to learn in the Antarctic at the South Pole. Eventually, colonists might even be able to live comfortably without spacesuits or breathing equipment. It sounds far-fetched now, but the day may come when Mars will serve as Earth's lifeboat. The dinosaurs were wiped out by a planetary impact, probably a comet or an asteroid. And uh, when you see the devastation that was caused by that wiped out, God knows how many percentage of, of the species on the planet, those sort of things can happen again. And so if you want to look at the noble image of trying to have the species survive beyond just our children and grandchildren, a lot of people would say we have to get off this planet and establish a foothold somewhere else. Since the beginning of time, humankind has felt compelled to explore driven to open new frontiers. No single nation or people can hope to reach Mars alone. It will take an international effort by governments all over the world. The quest for the Red Planet is the first page in a new chapter of human history. A thousand years from now, people remember the late 20th century, early 21st century in ways we can't imagine now. But they will remember the big things. They will remember if people got their act together and got to Mars. They will remember if we found life around another star. Those are the things worthy of the space programs of the world. In the future, we may look back on the early Mars explorers as the pioneers of a new frontier in space. And the red planet that once seemed so cold and distant will be full of promise, a place like Earth we may one day. <laughs>